once kids. And go back far enough, we probably would have done the exact same thing. And it's taken years of painful lessons for most of us to learn that if you eat ice cream sandwiches for breakfast, you feel awful by the end of the day. Now, generally speaking, we, we have a basic idea of what types of foods uh, are healthy for us and what types are not. We know eat our vegetables, don't devour endless amounts of ice cream. But I think the question that this passage raises for all of us is what is sort of the spiritual equivalent to the meat and vegetables and the good things that we should be eating, and what's the spiritual equivalent to the ice cream and cotton candy? What kinds of things should we be seeking out and pursuing if we want to grow spiritually? And what kinds of things uh, should we not really expect much from? The way theologians have framed this question is, what are the ordinary means of God's grace? As in, how does God ordinarily grow us in our faith? I think this passage both raises the question and shows us the answer. Uh, it sort of sets the stage in verse 41. If you look down there, we're told, so those who received his word, that is Peter's, were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now, I want you to do another thought experiment. Imagine this time we hold an event, say our 4th of July picnic, and Steve gets up and he preaches a sermon, and suddenly 3,000 members of Greenbelt or the surrounding community suddenly believe, want to be baptized, and join the church. I imagine we would all be pretty excited. But sooner or later, somebody, some pessimistic person probably, is going to start raising concerns like, where are we going to meet? This room would get really tight with 3,000 people. How are we going to take care of all those in need? And also, how are we going to instruct all of these people in the fundamentals of the faith. Many of them may have very little knowledge of what Christianity teaches. And how are we going to teach so many people? You can imagine these are sort of the thoughts that are probably facing the apostles. They are doubtlessly really excited, but also there are serious difficulties ahead of them. How are they going to grow all these new Christians into mature believers. And let's not forget the gravity of the situation. Uh, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, that the devil prowls around looking for someone to devour. And so it's easy for one of these new sheep to kind of stray and for him to strike. And Paul tells some probably equally new Christians in Acts 4.22 that it is through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And so we, the, the concern here is that we cannot leave these new Christians as just sort of saplings in the faith who will be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and the attacks of the enemy. No, somehow we are going to have to grow them up into these giant redwoods that can withstand the, the plights of life, the difficulties that will face them. We need them to become strong in doctrine, to kill indwelling sin in their lives, to conform themselves more and more to the image of Christ, and have all the benefits of redemption, an increasing assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Spirit, increasing grace and perseverance to the end. I suspect we've all had these concerns for people we know, and it is doubtless that the apostles here have these concerns for all of these new Christians. 
And I think these are not things that just new Christians need. These are things that all Christians need. And so uh, the question that this passage places before us is how are these Christians going to grow? What are those ordinary means of God's grace? I, I think when I was a young Christian and began to ask many of these questions, I was probably given uh, some unhelpful advice. Whether it was intentionally or not, I, I don't know. Uh, but I, I think the general sentiment was that the way we grow in our faith is it's those things that cause you to feel close to God. Uh, those things should kind of be repeated, rinse and repeat kind of mentality. Uh, and, and we figure out what those things are, and then we just keep doing them. And so I, I think uh, in my context, it was kind of what, what we did was you tried to go to conferences or retreats, uh, perhaps go on missions trips. Um, I, I know other people uh, would tell me that, you know, what you need is you just need to find a place that gives you a, a good worship experience. Um, I, I've met other people who have said, well, what we kind of need is we need to bring ourselves within uh, the ancient traditions of the church. That, that's kind of what will grow us in our faith. And, and you've probably met some who basically, you know, think every, the best stuff is always online. You can find the best preachers, the best music, the best everything. We can just kind of do that. And I'm not saying that these things are bad. I have and do use many of these things. But what I'm saying is I don't think these are the normal ways in which God, we should expect God to grow us in our faith. In fact, as opposed to that, I think we want the ordinary means of grace that God lays out for us in this passage here. And I think if you look down at verses 41 and 42, you can see them all uh, listed here. Children, pay attention. This is the answer to the first question in your children's bulletin. So we can see um, verse 41, we see they are baptized. Verse 42, they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, the apostles are probably not only giving new instructions, but also expounding the Old Testament. So the word of God is taking front and center here. The fellowship to the breaking of bread, which is another name for the Lord's Supper, and the prayers. And so I think these are the things that God uh, has ordained for us to normally grow in our faith. God can, of course, grow us in our faith any way he likes. But I think these right here, uh, God has com both commanded and promised to bless us by means of these things. And so if we want to grow into those giant redwoods in the faith, these are the means by which we should pursue them. This is, uh, I've become persuaded of this, and I hope to persuade both your mind and conscience that this is indeed the case. So let's think for a moment about the word. Throughout redemptive history, the word has always been front and center for God's people. Psalm 1 tells us of the blessed man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And he is like a tree planted by streams of water who yields his fruit in season, and his leaf does not wither. And so the image we get is the one who meditates on the law of God, on the word of God, he grows up to be this strong tree that is not blown down easily. Deuteronomy 13.2 tells us that even if a prophet comes, someone working miraculous signs, and speaks something against the word, the written word of God, he is to be rejected. God is testing us to see if we really, truly believe what he has given us. 
And I think Isaiah sums up the attitude in Isaiah 8.20 when he says, to the teaching, or we could say to the Torah, and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. And so the, the idea is we live by the word of God. It is to that that we will cling to. The New Testament has an equally strong emphasis. Uh, in 2 Timothy 1.14, Paul tells Timothy, guard the deposit. That is the word of God that was given to you, that was entrusted to you. And if you think about it, what do you set guards around? It is those things that you view as most valuable. But I think a very important passage for this is actually in 1 Timothy 4.16. If you can flip over there, I would encourage you to do so. Paul tells Timothy, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching, persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now, you may be saying, wait a minute, how can Paul say that? Does he not say in other places like Ephesians 2 that it is by grace you are saved through faith? How now can he say it is through persisting in the word? It's the word that saves you. Well, I think the reason Paul can kind of tie these two ideas together is because the way that we are normally saved is through the word. Uh, the, God could, in theory, save you in another way, but the word of God and being saved are so closely tied together in his mind that he can just connect the two. Just assume that uh, if you're saved, it's because the word was preached to you. Uh, sort of like we assume that if you're a human, you're going to have 10 fingers. Not everyone has 10 fingers, but it's common enough that we just assume that's going to be the case, unless we're being super technical and specific. And so I think that's why Paul in Romans 10, 14 can ask, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? The assumed answer is going to be, well, they can't. So we need to go and preach the word. Now, you could ask, Paul, couldn't God just zap the information into somebody's brain? And the answer is, of course, yes, he can. But uh, we have no reason to expect him to do that because he has told us how this is ordinarily going to happen and so we should expect it to happen that way and we should pursue it that way. If God wants to use other means in an unusual situation, that's his business. But what we are to do is going to be to cling to his commandments. Now, we can also see that the word not only saves us, but it's also building us up. So Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Do you know what that means? That when we are reading through this book here, we have God's promise that it can build us up. It can teach us. It can rebuke us of our faults. God has promised that this book can do this. And so we need to, we can expect and assume that if we pursue his word, that he will bless us. He will grow us. And so let's return to the question of why we should expect this to build it up. Children, this is the answer to the second question in your children's bulletins. Why should we expect God to build us up by the ordinary means of grace? Answer, because God has promised to do so. Now, I think it is important to remember that uh, God is not going to be mocked. The Bible is not some magical spell book that if you say the right words, you pass your eyes over the page, it will magically make you holier. 
No, we have to approach the Bible reverently. And I think older theologians have given us helpful advice that if this is going to bless us, we need the Holy Spirit to work through the word. It's not that the Bible is magical. It's that the spirit ordinarily works through the word. And with that in mind, they have told us that uh, when we read the word, we should attend to it with diligence, preparation, with prayer, receive it with faith and love, lay it up in our hearts, and practice it in our lives. I think the second means of grace that we see mentioned in this passage are what is oftentimes called the sacraments or the ordinances, depending on who you ask, which that is uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper. These are both signs instituted by Christ, which visually show us the gospel and ought and must be explained by the word of God. Uh, I think we can say a lot about them, but right now I want to just focus on the fact that they are very important. So in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Christ is giving some of his final instructions to his disciples, and he gives them three commands. He tells them to make disciples, to baptize them, and to teach them everything he has taught them. So we see baptism is given high prominence uh, in the ministry of Christ uh, in this instruction, and throughout the book of Acts, we see baptism playing a major role. Um, we also see the Lord's Supper instituted uh, at the Last Supper, uh, but also in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, Paul tells the Corinthians that I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. Now, there's something very interesting about that statement. Paul says he received it from the Lord, and yet Paul was not at the Last Supper which seems to suggest that when God revealed himself to Paul, at some point, he gave the command for the Lord's Supper. In theory, it, perhaps he got it some other way, but that seems to be what happened here. And so it seems that Christ revealed this to Paul and said, make sure this happens when you go on your missionary journeys. Now, you may be thinking, well, yes, baptism and the Lord's Supper, they're very nice, but I just don't really see what, what they actually do for me. Um, and I think uh, there's a lot of discussion what is actually going on here. But I think the point we need to embrace and take home is that at the very least, it is important or it should be important to us because it is important to Christ. Not only did he take these measures to see that it was brought everywhere, but in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine 29, and 30, we are told that anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Now, Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, tells them that God takes the Lord's Supper so seriously that some of them have actually died because they were taking it in an unworthy manner. This is literally a matter of life and death. And you can say, uh, you know, I I've seen many people take it in an unworthy manner. Perhaps I've done it myself, and God hasn't seemed to zap me or anyone else. And, but I think that misses the point. The point is, God did it once, and then he wrote it down so we would all read it and know about it. And it highlights the importance that it takes in the mind of Christ. He views this as very important. And so even if we are still struggling on what exactly is going on here, we should take it very seriously. And I think it's fair to infer that if Christ will curse those who take it in an unworthy manner. He will also bless those who take it in a worthy manner. 
And that is why we see uh, the apostles having the, this new church partaking of the Lord's Supper and baptism. Now, the next thing that they list here is uh, we see that they are taking part in the fellowship, the fellowship of the church. Now, we can make many arguments for why Christian uh, fellowship is a means of grace. Uh, if you read Romans 12 or Ephesians 4 or 1 Corinthians 12, you will get the imagery of we are all the body of Christ. And we are all different members. And we are not interchangeable with each other. And then you ask the question, well, how does Christ minister to his different members of his body? The answer is with the other parts of the body. We are a means of grace to each other. And this is for all of the body. We all have a different role. Paul is emphatic. You cannot be cutting off parts of the body. Even the parts you think do the least are oftentimes the most important. You never see what your stomach does, but it does an awful lot for you. And this is probably why the book of Hebrews exhorts us that we must not neglect the gathering of ourselves, because that is like cutting us ourselves off from the body. However, I think this principle is probably best demonstrated in 2 Corinthians 7. If you have a moment, turn there. Look at verse 5. Paul tells us, talking about his missionary journeys, For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. Now, when people are talking like that, you think, this person, he is down. He is depressed. He's just, this is more than just a bad day. This guy has been roughed up. And we know Paul, he is no pansy. Um, in Acts 14, 19, uh, a city stoned him, threw him outside the city, and left him for dead. And he gets up, goes to the next city, and preaches again. So the fact that Paul here is at the point of, it seems, almost despair, Paul, who is normally so full of confidence and zeal and energy, is just like broken, you think, wow, he is down. But look at verse 6. Look down at that verse. What does he say? But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. Look at that verse and ask yourself, who comforts Paul? It's God. By what means does God use to comfort Paul? The coming of Titus. And so we see Titus here is a means of God's grace to Paul. This is how he revives and refreshes Paul. Something as simple as Titus coming. And if you read that passage and ask yourself, what does Titus actually do? He doesn't seem to be bringing him any present or gift. He doesn't seem to be doing all that much. He does tell him about how the Corinthians are doing. But other than that, it seems like he just shows up. And that is what God used to revive Paul's spirit when he is broken. Now, I think this is a very important point because I think it's very easy to kind of fall into the thinking. I've done this many times myself. Uh, when you say, I should go to small group, but, you know, all I ever do is I go there, I sit in a chair, and then I leave. And I'm not actually doing anything. And yet, we can see in this passage, Titus doesn't seem to be doing much more than that. But your very presence encourages your fellow believers. I, I think just seeing someone else who values the word of God, who thinks, yes, this is worth coming out and devoting myself to, that is a major encouragement to everyone else who is there. 
in Romans chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, Paul tells to the Roman church, I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Now that sounds really impressive. What is this spiritual gift that Paul is going to give to the Roman church? Verse 12, that is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. So what is Paul telling them is this gift he wants to give them is that they are going to be encouraged by his faith. But also he, the apostle, will be encouraged by their faith. We gathering together are going to encourage each other by, at the very least by just seeing each other's faith. Now there are probably countless more ways that gathering with God's people can act as a means of grace, but that alone, I think, should serve as a reminder. This is important. We need to gather with God's people. The final means that is mentioned is uh, prayer. And I suspect I probably don't need to argue, at least not on a theoretical level, that prayer is important. My, my guess is most of us uh, intellectually, in theory, say, yes, prayer is important. I have found, at least personally, that the struggle tends to be transferring that from kind of the, the cognitive assent, yes, this is important, to actually believing, yes, I, I should do it. So often, it feels like um, we pray and we pray and we pray and nothing seems to happen. Or we stop praying and nothing really seems to change. And so it, it's easy to kind of fall into the line of thinking, well, you know, I have other things that need to be done. Uh, and I think it's important to remember that God knows that I suspect most of us struggle in this way. He remembers our frame. He remembers that we are dust. In fact, Luke 18, 1, we're told, and he, that is Jesus, told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So he tells them this parable, and the whole purpose, Luke tells us up front, is to encourage his disciples to always pray and not lose heart. Meaning that the disciples themselves struggled with thinking this is uh, this is something I should be doing. And you remember before Christ's death when he is praying earnestly to his father and he tells his disciples, watch and pray, they fall asleep on him. And so this is a struggle that is common to, to all, or at least to most. And yet I think once again we need to return to the word and look at the promises. James 6.16 6, tells us, the prayer of a righteous person has great power. Luke 18, 7, will not God give justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? And perhaps most convicting of all, James 4, 2, you have not because you ask not. And so I think oftentimes, uh, we are going to have to remind ourselves that no, the promises of God are that this is an important means of grace. This is how he grows us. This is a way he works in this world. And force ourselves to own up to the question, are we going to believe these promises or are we not? Now, you've probably noticed that in this passage, uh, in verse 43, signs and miracles are mentioned. And in verse 44, uh, it mentions them giving up their property. Uh, and I noticeably did not include this in my list, and I think I should probably explain briefly why that is. Uh, the reason I think the miracles and signs are not uh, the ordinary means of God's grace is because I think those are attached to the prophets who God sends to uh, bring his word to his people. And 
uh, brings basically right new scripture. So we see Moses as kind of that first original prophet. And when God sends him to the people of Israel, he asks the natural question, well, they're probably not going to believe me. And so God gives him those signs. He grants him the power to work signs and wonders. And I think this is the pattern of the prophets throughout uh, the Bible. And this is pretty clearly stated in Acts 14.3 when we're told, So they, that is Paul and Barnabas, remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So we see Paul and Barnabas preaching the word, telling them the new covenant has indeed come, and God verifies it by signs and wonders. Now, can God work miracles now? Of course he can. And does he? Yes, I think he does. Uh, but they're not going to be attached to people like they were to Moses or to the apostles. I think there's also needs to be a note made about verse 44, where we're told that all who believed were together and had all things in common, and then finishing up, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Um, now, some tr have tried to read into this, these verses sort of a Christian communalism where we all own nothing and are happy. Now, I don't think that's what's going on here. If we flip, look just two chapters later at uh, Acts 5, 4, when Ananias basically does the same thing. He sells a field and he gives some of the proceeds to the poor, pretending to do what Barnabas did. Uh, Peter tells him, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? You didn't have to give up your field. And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? You, you did own this. And Micah 4.4 4, uh, kind of gives us this painting of the eschaton and he says they shall sit every man under his own vine and under his own fig tree what i think is happening here is that the generosity and hospitality that we see commanded in letters like first and second timothy uh, to take care of the members of the church is being applied here to this rather unusual situation remember 3,000 members were just added to the church. And the passage says at the end, more are being added day by day. And kind of one of those original questions was, how are we going to take care of all those in need? It's going to require some pretty extreme measures. And so you can imagine if suddenly we had to take care of 3,000 people, uh, it might be necessary to start selling land off if we are going to do that. And so that's why Barnabas does this, and Ananias pretends to do the same thing. Now, I want to return to our original question, which I believe this passage raises. How should we expect God to mature us in our faith, kind of build us up into those giant redwoods? And, and the answer, I think, is it's through the word, it's through the Lord's Supper, baptism, Christian fellowship, and prayer. And if you think about it, that is actually why our church service is set up the way it is. We read the word, we preach the word, we sing the word, we administer the sacraments, um, and we pray. If you th that sort of sums up what we do every Sunday. That, that's not an accident. And I think it is important to remember that these things are not like magical spells that sort of zap grace into us. Uh, they must be sought with faith because it's only by the blessing of Christ and the working of the Holy Spirit that they will actually benefit us. <clears throat> and so let me encourage 
and exhort you to make use of these uh, God-ordained means of grace, uh, to cling to them, to cling to them kind of like uh, there's that image of Jacob when he wrestles with God and he just holds on for his life, kind of uh, getting dragged through the dust, but yet he won't let go. And he says, what does he say? He says, I won't let go until you bless me. And I think this is wa- the way we want to treat these means of grace. Because we know that if we cling to them in faith, we are clinging to God's promises. And if we cling to God's promises, we are clinging to God himself.